Welcome to today's webinar. I'm your host, Jason Church, with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Today we are joined by preservation architect Jack Pyburn. Today we're going to discuss preserving African American historic properties. Jack, it's my pleasure to introduce you not only as an NCPTD board member, but as a preservation architect with over 35 years experience. Jack Pyburn has worked on two dozen important African American historic sites from iconic and international to local insignificance. We will discuss his experiences and lessons learned with the objective of broadening the interest in and for conserving African American heritage in the United States. Mr. Pyburn was raised in Shreveport, Louisiana, attended Texas A&M University and Washington University in St. Louis, and worked for 10 years in St. Louis before coming to Atlanta in 1981. He had his own preservation architecture practice for 25 years before joining Lord Ekin Sargent as preservation studio director in 2007. Jack, I'd like to turn it over to you and we can uh, start today's webinar. It is extremely rich with history, um, and obviously. And um, while we are currently, um, in general terms, focused on civil rights history, uh, African American history is obviously much broader and much deeper. And, um, and over time, will be uh, fleshed out in, in uh, much greater terms. The new uh, Washington Museum is just incredible in terms of the, uh, setting the context and providing the, the place where that broader um, recording and communicating and understanding of history uh, can be uh, discovered. Uh, I think the subject is very timely and important. Um, I think the subject, one reason it's timely and important um, is that the civil rights movement in particular is still ongoing. And uh, we, we tend to think of it somewhat being frozen in the 60s. Uh, but uh, obviously, like all history, uh, it continues on and uh, change happens at, at different paces. Um, it is complex uh, and it is diverse. And it's part of everybody's history is a collective uh, sphere, and um, African American history is really a part of, of everybody's history and has uh, wonderful things and important things for us all to, um, to learn and understand and experience. Um, so it's an honor to, to um, have had the opportunity to work on some important sites. Uh, and, and uh, facilities and to share that experience with you. Um, I wanted to to say that the examples uh, oh, uh, uh, that I'm going to right illustrate, I think, are, are significant um, uh, sites and, and have some interesting stories and experiences to transform uh, or to transmit to you um, it is not an exhaustive survey. It's not a scholarly study. Um, it is an opportunity to broaden uh, the exposure on the subject. What I plan to do um, today is to first, um, I thought it would be helpful for you to understand where I'm coming from, from a preservation standpoint. So I'm gonna give you a brief orientation to this preservation architect's perspective of preservation. Um, I want to um, identify a range of issues uh, and conditions that um, I think face African American sites in particular today. Um, and then I'm going to go through a series of case studies of different scales uh, of sites and projects and uh, talk about uh, their characteristics and challenges and successes. Uh, and then I hope we have a you send in questions. I hope to learn as much from you and your, your curiosity and knowledge um, as for what I'm, I'm able to provide. So I hope we have not only questions, but some uh, capacity for discussion. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, uh, sorry, just a second. There we go. So just to start a little bit of my perspective of, of preservation, uh, this is how I look at history. 
Um, it, it is like a, a cable, uh, and the various strands make up history. And any given uh, exercise of dealing with a historic site can only deal with a, with a few, if if not one, uh, strand of uh, of history. So it's a much more complex, and every site has a complex set of histories that generally, I think, include a core. Uh, oftentimes, preservation is around the core piece, uh, but it also includes these other uh, um, components that that represent the whole. Uh, important thing about this to me is that when we deal with a historic property in whatever capacity, we're only dealing with a limited part of it. So um, it's critical that our respect for and protection of and, and of the fabric that can interpret that the largest part of that uh, that larger rope um, is preserved for future generations. I'll talk a little bit about more about that. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, things that I work off of is that preservation is not in black and white. Uh, preservation is in shades of gray. Uh, and it goes back to the understanding of history. We only have a, a certain amount of history that's available to us. And, um, and we have artifacts or properties that are altered and, and um, different from what they might be as they relate to the more, more significant pieces of history. So it requires a, an intellectual construct in order to, uh, to shape an approach to treatment. Um, that is based on as deep a, a narrative as one can possibly gain to understand the fabric you're looking at and how to interpret it. What is in black and white is what exists. So I think that's very important uh, that, uh, and the importance of this is that um, we shouldn't take anything for granted. Uh, remember a project we did actually here at Oakland Plantation on the doctor's house. I'll show this in a minute, but uh, the period of significance ended in 1960. Uh, and that was the, the time when the, um, the plantation stopped for, uh, functioning from an agricultural perspective. And uh, in the mid 50s, mid to late 50s, they had actually drywalled the interior of the doctor's house. Uh, and in struggling with the approach to how to treat that property, the decision was made to to keep the drywall uh, overlay uh, of an earlier period in that house to preserve its entire history relative to the agricultural production of the plantation. Um, and that's a that's a case where every piece of that building needed to be understood. And it was a it is a tangible piece and and uh, uh, should be dealt with carefully. So my next perspective is that all treatment to a building is an intervention. And uh, I think we think about preservation treatment as being something different, it's something careful, it's something uh, um, sensitively done, and it is. My point here is that all treatment needs to be considered sensitively and in the context of the, uh, of the, uh, of the historic setting. Uh, and so there's a there's a responsibility for all levels of intervention, from the matching of the mortar and the brick, to um, an insertion of a new component that that must exist in a historic context. All of them should be uh, dealt with as a as a thoughtful treatment. Contributing fabric is precious. It goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about the fabric that exists. Patina is good. Uh, I think as a, uh, generally we want everything to look brand new like the historic structure we built yesterday uh, if we're restoring it and um, in fact uh, careful uh, securing and retaining patina is a very positive thing to do. And obviously the basic preservation principle of repair don't replace uh, goes along with these others. So this is my little construct about the context of preservation. And um, we all only exist in the present. And um, 
And so the uh, question is, uh, the past is, uh, the present is a fleeting thing and things are moving from the future to the past is in every second that goes by. So I put together this little construct of, uh, so here we have the past and, and the, the uh, yellow area obviously is, is all of history. And if we only have a past and we have no future, then what we have is the end. Uh, so the next then is, is the future. And if you notice on the past, the, we know more about what happened yesterday than we know about what happened last year. Uh, and it's in the future we know what may happen tomorrow better than what we know may happen in two weeks. So we have this phenomenon of dealing with the most information very close to us when we are um, charged with trying to uh, balance and to um, examine uh, much longer areas of history. So if with the future and no past, then what we have is Alzheimer's. So um, next. So what we have then is a necessity. The past can't exist without the future and vice versa. We have a necessity of dealing in a balanced way. And that means that we, to be balanced, we need to bring as much of that past forward in order to inform the future as possible. And we also need to embrace the future and have it uh, draw from the past and enrich the future by having done it. So this is a little, another way of, of communicating this. Um, so here we have the same past and the future. And here we have recorded history as opposed to all of history. So we don't know all of history. We only know recorded history. And, uh, and for a given historic resource, uh, we have a, a piece of that history of the, of the recorded history. Uh, so in a, in a certain project, we're going to be dealing with a slice of that history. And uh, in a project to reuse a building, we're dealing with a little slice of what we think the future might be. The interesting thing about that is that we don't know further out we go what that uh, future might be. And so we're working off of a very narrow band of presumption about the future and making decisions in a historic context that could dramatically alter for very short-term gain. And, uh, and I think this is the the struggle, the tension in the process of dealing uh, with a historic property, whether that be from an interpretive standpoint or whether it be from a more functional use standpoint. So here's who we're, we're doing for. We're adapting for the short term, but we're preserving for the long term. And I think it's important to keep that in mind as we make decisions, again, particularly when we're dealing with, uh, with reuse of, of historic resources. So the next, go ahead. Uh, the next thing is about the use of buildings. And typically in modern terms, because of, of uh, organizational theory and, and management practice, we've gone through a period where uh, certain classifications of work fit in certain physical environments, whether that's the 8 by 10 cubicle and everyone that's doing a certain job has an 8 by 10 cubicle. That kind of thought process uh, has been damaging to reuse of historic buildings. And in fact, people are much more, much more uh, uh, flexible than that. So it's important um, in, to look at functional performance criteria and spatial relationships than just spatial requirements, dimensional requirements, and, and uh, acclimating people to different types of work settings. Interesting experience for me has been that uh, when I've taken a, a project where a building has not been maintained for a long period, 
the people that have occupied it, their, their view is, get me out of this building, and I never want to come back. That when the project is finished and they've seen the character and quality of the building they left be brought back, it's the first place they want to go back. And I think it speaks to this notion of it's not about uh, some rigid notion of work environments. It's more about understanding what work needs to be done and how you can creatively within the fabric of the building uh, insert that uh, uh, ability to function and to perform uh, and to add an extra level of motivation and energy by virtue, by virtue of the environment you've created. Uh, this diagram is a, uh, kind of the way I look at a project. In a building, I've been given a, a book with a diary, if you will, that has had uh, a series of chapters written over time. And I've been asked to write a chapter. Uh, and uh, in writing that chapter, I should acknowledge and understand the previous chapters uh, but also need to be aware of the aspirations for the future and to be, uh, and to write that chapter in a way that future chapters can be written that are coherent to the overall history of a, of a particular resource. So this is kind of the way I think about uh, how to approach a project and the context for making detailed preservation decisions. So here, and I, I want to apologize for uh, for this being just a page full of text, but I wasn't sure how to do this otherwise. But I wanted to go through a series of, of uh, thoughts and observations about uh, uh, historic African American resources um, that I have uh, learned over uh, my experience. Uh, obviously, the first is the huge amount of untapped history. Uh, I think the, the story of Hidden Figures, the recent movie, and, and Dorothy Johnson is a good example. The history of NASA uh, up until recently has had nothing in it about the African-American women who were so instrumental in, in taking us to the moon. Uh, and um, uh, I also, another example I have is of a, a man named Emmanuel Brown uh, in uh, Dallas County, Alabama, south of Selma. Uh, Manuel Brown uh, was a, uh, the son of a slave. Uh, the um, plantation owner uh, recognized Emanuel's interest in drive for education, uh, helped him uh, get to first manual training schools, and he ended up going to Harvard. Uh, Manuel Brown got a um, uh, had a strong uh, connection with the community in, in Boston uh, and could have st easily stayed in Boston uh, for his career. Uh, but he was an educator and he had an affinity for the environment that he, the uh, community that he came from uh, with the support of a uh, Mrs. Street in Boston. Came, uh, Emmanuel came back to Dallas County, um, Alabama and set up the Street Manual Training School. As treat, the street manual training school functioned until uh, uh, desegregation, and like most uh, African American uh, educational structures, was abandoned. Uh, but Emmanuel Brown's story and that um, that resource is sitting in the in the rural area of, of Middle Alabama now, with a. Um, uh, Desire and need to uh, to put shine light on what Emmanuel Brown's values were and what that resource can do for education in that part of Alabama. So it's just an example. Those kinds of stories are everywhere, and I think it's the kind of untapped history that um, the deeper it's explored, uh, the more it will come to light and be a, a, a value to an inspiration. For everyone. The second is civil rights period in history is not over and it's still evolving. And I think that's a particularly interesting um, way and an important way to think about how we deal with, um, with particularly civil rights history uh, because um, 
it, it, um, we need to look at it not as a, a fixed point in time between 1960 and 1968, uh, but uh, uh, but a, an ongoing story. And how do we um, organize and communicate uh, that rich and important early civil rights history? When I say early, um, uh, the late uh, the second half of the 20th century. Um, as it, as it continues to evolve, evolve. The third is about the impact of integration. And I mentioned it um, uh, as it related to education. And you see it across the board. And I'll show you uh, examples in a minute of, uh, of where integration um, basically vacated uh, many important African American sites and businesses that were in existence because of integration and because of segregation. So how you deal with that um, that uh, set of conditions, I think, is a, a particularly uh, challenging and important one to wrestle with about what the how to, in the future how do you interpret the uh, the conditions in a uh, segregated environment that was dr dry, driven to uh, achieve integration. Um, the next one is um, most much of the preservation uh, uh, work has happened. It's been around post Civil War in part because the records uh, are better and the resources are uh, are. Uh, more, uh, there are more of them. The more recent uh, they were, were built or developed. The other interesting piece is so much of it is modern history, particularly architectural. I'll show you buildings that that are modern movement buildings. They are all inspired by modern architecture, and uh, so there's an interesting correlation between modern architecture and uh, and 20th century uh, African American history. The limited and obscure documentation is something that um, is difficult, and uh, again, I'll show you a project in a minute where that uh, has been uh, light shined on that recently. Uh, it puts a more importance on oral histories, and oral histories, as many of you know, uh, can be tricky. A memory is not always uh, locked solid, and one person's observation is maybe taken in a different context than another. But, uh, but it, it means that oral histories, uh, while they're still around, are still extremely valuable in um, trying to document uh, conditions that existed. The other, the next point is that not all uh, uh, African American structures were about high style. Uh, and, and buildings need to be looked at as vessels for an exceptional history. And in and of themselves, and the materiality, the way they were constructed, why the materials were selected, are all architecturally quite important and um, um, need to be uh, looked at that way and looked at creatively. Um, so I think uh, it's important to think about the architectural aspects and the value of the architecture in a different way. Uh, and that goes to number seven. And that is that, um, uh, well, I'll take that back. Let me skip, skip to number eight. Uh, number eight really is populist preservation has been much more about traditional styles and high style buildings. So, uh, to some degree, the downside of that is that the, sort of the populist preservation entities have uh, been, uh, their, their focus has maybe not been as balanced in the past. I think there's more attention being given to African-American properties, but it's still very much a, um, a sphere of interest, uh, a larger populist interest that's around uh, traditional and high-style buildings. One of the realities of, uh, as a result of that is that much of uh, African-American advocacy uh, is grassroots uh, and um, and much of it is, is church-based. So the church is very much a, a 
community entity that um, is the leader uh, in uh, preservation of African American sites and raising the awareness and uh, attention to um, how to do it and how to do it well. Number nine is, is the lack of resources, and uh, it goes along with the uh, fact that a, a lot of resources go uh, over a broad base of, of uh, more populous preservation. And how do we grow the resources for preserving uh, African American sites and features? Modernization is a is an interesting issue. Uh, modernization uh, is both a, it goes back to the issue of, of um, the whole civil rights movement to move past uh, uh, segregation. Uh, modernization is viewed as uh, democratic uh, and, and right to continue to grow into the future. And so there are properties that are meaningful for a period in time that uh, uh, have been modernized and in order to keep them functioning. In some cases, uh, they represented economic survival if they didn't do that. So modernization is a, uh, is a challenge. And how do you do that, again, sensitively, uh, I think is something that um, it, it needs to be uh, enhanced in particularly with African-American resources. Um, the, the loss at, uh, or uh, at risk of loss of, of development encroachment, um, particularly in rural environments and, and suburban environments, the encroachment of development, the increase in property values uh, has been uh, a particular risk to, to important sites. Um, and the insensitive adjacent new developments, not um, being respectful of the of the resources there. Um, this is another area where um, community land use and development regulations could be more engaged in uh, keeping uh, having a, a, an acknowledgement of the historic context and a conscious response that respectful response to it. Number 13, I think, is a particularly, and I don't uh, pretend to to know the extent of this, but I do believe it is a uh, it is a phenomenon in some situations, and that is uh, for um, African Americans who uh, have have the stewardship of the ownership of the responsibility for important historic sites. A distrust for outsiders for help. If there have been too many experiences where uh, they have been unsatisfactory relationships or uh, not having um, had a, 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 an adequate cooperative and collaborative exercise to produce an outcome. Uh, and I think this is a particular concern. Um, and uh, to the degree that it does exist, Finding ways to break that uh, down in a way that uh, not uh, it's not a matter of, of breaking down the group that, that, that has a, a concern about trust. It's a more breaking it down of, of, of developing uh, better relationships that can cooperatively and collaboratively achieve the objective that the that the community wants to have happen and achieve their goals. I think finally, for me, a particular concern is the um, limited number, of relatively small number of African Americans in architecture and planning with Historic Preservation Foundation or FOCUS. Um, it's been known for some time that uh, African American participation in architecture has, has flagged way behind. Uh, and uh, and I think in preservation it's even further behind. Uh, there is now one preservation program at a historically black college and university of Delaware State. Uh, it is not in the architecture program. The Tuskegee School of Architecture is thinking seriously about developing a uh, uh, 
uh, historic preservation program in their school of architecture. So those are those are optimistic signs of, of that changing. Obviously, uh, participation in all preservation programs uh, is a is an important piece as well. But I think particularly for HBCUs, there is not only a, a need but there's a an opportunity uh, for them to develop the, the capability that would be uh, would be very productive and, and beneficial both to the institutions and to their students. So with that, I'd like to now uh, go through a series of case studies. And um, and the first one I'd like to just uh, make a comment or two on okay. uh, about the uh, Oakland Plantation Slave Quarters, uh, which I had the opportunity to write the historic structure report for some years ago. And I think for me, the, the point to make here is that these two structures, except for uh, for privilege and, and scale, these two structures embody all of the same aspects of humanity and capability and, and rich history and family stories. Uh, and they're, they're two different scales, two very different sets of experiences. And, um, and, and I just think there uh, is parity in these two structures that is extremely important in how we look at, um, at African-American historic sites uh, as not a uh, subordinated or subservient kind of structure, but uh, one that is regal and, and has a, um, a, a richness in its history to be discovered, understood, and experienced. You can go in this uh, house and 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 feel the, um, the the context, feel the experience of living uh, in that structure at that scale at that time in that agricultural environment, uh, and what it took to um, survive, achieve, uh, and um, and pers persevere um, are extremely powerful. So here's the same cottage, and on the, on the right is the doctor's house. So I mentioned the doctor's house from a um, from the drywall uh, exercise from, <clears throat> from the late 50s. In fact, <clears throat> the doctor's house is seven different iterations. So the piece of this house on the left, this is the image on the right, piece of the house on the left is a Creole cottage with uh, French um, uh, hand-hewn framing, undoubtedly done by slaves, uh, marked in the French nomenclature of, of uh, a log building, uh, and then six other additions, most of which were uh, uh, constructed uh, in whole or part by the folks who lived in that house on the left. And to me, when you look at the craftsmanship and the quality and the intelligence that went into building that um, and by the group that lived in the house on the right. The two sit very close to one another and to me represent the um, the values of the, of the house on the left embodied in the house on the right. The next um, example is the Majestic Simpkins House. Uh, this is a small little vernacular structure in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, Majestic Simpkins was a, uh, an educator who got involved in trying to solve the tubercul tubercul tuberculosis uh, uh, problems of, of South Carolina uh, in the early 20th century. And uh, because of her involvement in the NAACP, was fired from that job. Uh, and she was doing a very effective job. Uh, she then went to work on a education federal court case called Briggs versus Elliot, which, uh, which had to do with the equalization of schools. And the, uh, the uh, case uh, became an underpinning to the uh, Brown versus Board of Education case in Topeka, Kansas. Interesting thing about this, uh, many um, African-American 
leaders and uh, scholars came through this house. Uh, she was well known, uh, certainly throughout the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, and during the preparation for Brown versus Board of Education, Thurgood Marshall actually lived in a uh, a little small duplex outbuilding behind this house that still exists. I, I wish I could have found a photo of it. But um, Thurgood Marshall came and worked on his case for Brown versus Board of Education. And um, and this is a little um, reasonably um, nondescript house in the middle of a of a uh, partially remaining subdivision uh, street uh, off of downtown uh, Columbia. But it is, in fact, an extremely important site, not only to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and I might say the Historic Columbia Foundation now owns this building, has restored it, interprets it, and, uh, and it is, it's got a secure future. Uh, but it's also uh, a, a building of national importance. Again, an example of a, a little nondescript building that without its story being told, one wouldn't know it. The Montgomery bus station mm -hmm. uh, is a, a case where um, really some folks at the State Preservation Office uh, were highly driven to, uh, to save this building. It's a very important building. It was built in 51 off a of standard, 1951 off a of standard uh, uh, Greyhound bus uh, plans. Um, and uh, in 1961 was the site of the bus boycott uh, and the sit ins at the, at the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, um, uh, Freedom Rides and the sit ins that took place here. So, what you see behind it is a, is a federal courthouse. And in fact, the federal courthouse site has encroached up to the back wall of what you can see in the yellow brick. Um, the context is completely changed, and much of the civil rights, meaningful civil rights history, happened in the rear portion where the buses would swing in to an angle parking place and, uh, and unload and unload, and then swing back around the other side as they left. That, that part is all gone. Much of the interior um, was lost over time, but there is significant fabric that's there uh, and that fabric is, is sufficient to communicate some of the key pieces of, of the segregation history and the context in which the, uh, the sit-ins and, and the uh, um, reaction to the, uh, to the marches were, uh, were carried out. Um, the folks who... Um, were really responsible for and, and frankly continue to support and interpret and operate this facility. Did an excellent job of creating a uh, historic narrative that you can follow both along the front elevation of the building and when you get to the interior. Um, it is an example again of how development has encroached on this resource and the unfortunate loss of, of being able to experience and understand how the bus flow and the people flow actually worked where people were uh, attacked and, and uh, um, conflict happened in the rear of this building. But it is, a, it is an important resource, but it also is a case where it has, uh, its context has been dramatically altered. So the next... Uh, the next example, uh, we had the opportunity to work on the uh, Selma to Freedom, uh, Selma to Montgomery uh, Freedom Trail for the Park Service. Uh, and this was a particularly, it's a 54 mile stretch. Um, there were five marches that took place along this trail. Uh, the uh, conditions that exist today uh, are not the ones totally that existed when the, uh, when the marches happened. The alignments have changed. Uh, the uh, people on the walk uh, were staying on sites that were are, are now private property. So some important areas where 
events took place uh, are not accessible. Um, it is a fast moving uh, four lane divided highway now all the way between Montgomery and Selma. So the pedestrian environment is, is different. Uh, and how you can communicate the um, experience uh, that the people we see in this uh, photo uh, is, is extremely challenging. And uh, fortunately, the, the Park Service has built a very good interpretive center there. And, um, and that is a, that is a, a big help. And I, I know folks who have biked this route, and that's a way that one can certainly appreciate the distance that, uh, that this group covered uh, to, to make this statement. Uh, but it is a particularly challenging preservation and interpretive exercise to, uh, um, to communicate uh, what that experience was like. Uh, I'll add that there was a, an example of the, the kinds of things that can spin off from this is that um, the, uh, we had the opportunity to, to work with a class from Tuskegee's architecture program um, who were trying to address the transportation requirements and needs, particularly of older folks in Lowndes County, which you can see in the middle of the map, uh, which is one of the poorer counties in Alabama and the country. Uh, the need for them to be able to get to Montgomery or Selma for medical, for uh, groceries, for other types of banking services, all kinds of things, and the difficulty of them doing that now, and how you could tie in a transportation uh, arrangement uh, within Lyons County that could tie in into the Selma to Montgomery Trail uh, that has regular uh, public uh, transit serve, public bus service back and forth um, was a, a way that the uh, presence of that trail and the acknowledgement of that trail has uh, spawned other uh, uh, creative ideas for uh, serving this, this part of Alabama. So on the lower left, you see the environment today, and on the right, you see the, the marchers, and there was some, uh, there was some four-lane uh, at the time, but not nearly as much as there is now, it's fully four-lane now. And of course, the iconic uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, is still there, and still a, a, a marker. Well, this is a project actually that has been done by a, a very capable and uh, uh, creative uh, preservation group, New South Associates in Atlanta, group we work with a great deal. Uh, and I thought this was uh, Mary Beth Reed and Joe Joseph there, was first rate. Uh, I thought that th their experience and Mary Beth telling me about this was worth including. They were asked by, uh, by Charleston County to survey the historic resources of Char the African American resources of Charleston County. And uh, this was their first overlay of, um, of where African American resources were in Charleston County. And uh, the, the uh, map was then further refined uh, to identify uh, African-American communities. Uh, but then um, what they found was absolutely fascinating. So they found, one, that the communities, that the residents of the communities actually had different names for their community than what was on the county records and what the community generally referred to. And, and, uh, identifying these historic African-American communities. They also found that there were settlement patterns that were very different than other settlement patterns in the area. So this is one example of a settlement pattern. 
uh, of the Freedmen's uh, Era Settlement Pattern. And what they found was that you would find multiple generations living on these long, narrow lots. So you might have the earliest generation living closest to the road, and successively uh, their uh, uh, descendants would live further back in the site, as you can see how it's been subdivided there uh, on some of the parcels. So there was an entirely different kind of settlement pattern. And the settlement pattern became what started out as a windshield survey of architectural uh, and, um, styles and, and conditions became this exploration, completely different exploration of settlement patterns, of which the architectural piece then fit into that. The other thing they found and uh, embraced was that the important buildings were not, they were concrete block buildings, they were basic uh, frame buildings, they were buildings that on any uh, traditional windshield architectural survey would have gotten passed over uh, because they were, would be deemed not significant, not having architectural character, being basic materials, etc. They were the materials, they were the buildings that represented this community and therefore deserve the kind of attention that, um, uh, that, that these communities deserve. I don't know if this was a particularly interesting and important uh, examination of uh, of this kind of uh, discovery. I mean, this was a discovery, at least for this group and this study, and for the county, which, uh, according to Mary Beth, the county has embraced and is uh, looking at ways how they can be supportive of these communities, which are being encroached on by uh, suburban development. You can see in the upper right of this photo where suburban development is rapidly coming up to the edge of the property and could could easily take it over. So they're under threat from, from development as well. The Pleasant Hill neighborhood is another interesting story. Uh, so this is a, uh, a neighborhood, African American neighborhood, that uh, was uh, developed in, in the 1870s and 80s initially uh, and grew over time. It is the a uh, place where the prominent uh, African-American lawyers, doctors, uh, musicians, Little Richard lived in this neighborhood, uh, were, um, were, were raised. Uh, and uh, when the interstate highway came through, much like many uh, um, conditions throughout the U.S., uh, they tended to gravitate to, uh, based on land value and and they would go through and went through and disrupted and oftentimes destroyed many African-American neighborhoods. So here you see the interstate highway going through. And on the right, um, and, and when the interstate highway went through, there was a cooperative agreement to move um, the, uh, the houses in the shaded area to the, uh, to the main body of the community. And it was viewed as a preservation exercise. It was a commitment to a historic community. So to an interesting and philosophical question, uh, and, and social question for that matter, uh, about the moving of these houses. Because in preservation, uh, um, moving that structure basically, in most cases, causes it to be deemed insignificant. So there was a dilemma about moving it under the guise of preservation and yet um, it uh, negatively affecting its character from a historic standpoint. When we got into the exercise, it was as every bit as difficult as you can imagine. We obviously couldn't find a site for each house that had all the same topographic conditions that the one that it was set on originally. So we had to modify the sites to accept the houses, and the houses had to accept a different context than they were in. We couldn't keep them in the same grouping, because you can see you couldn't aggregate a, an area big enough to keep them in the same grouping. So they then became 
scattered throughout the community. So how does one rationalize, organize, agree, understand uh, an exercise like this? Uh, and for me, it was pretty simple, honestly. Um, we made a, a, an effort to be very respectful of, the, of each unit, of each house, and, uh, and preserving its integrity in and of itself, probably more like an artifact than, than, a, uh, than a living object, though they were intended for and they will be lived in again. But to, to, once you detach them from the, from the site, it becomes a little different. There was a commitment to do this. That commitment sat there for years. The, the, the Department of Transportation needed to, wanted to alter the configuration of the interchange you see in the upper right corner, and it triggered that memorandum of agreement uh, and caused the uh, belated uh, exercise of moving these houses to the other side of the street. Um, and um, it is a it is a challenging exercise, but I think one that that it's important to um, to live up to the commitments. Uh, it was an expensive commitment for uh, the Department of Transportation because it had been delayed for so long, uh, but one that that deserved to be fulfilled in some manner. And that is um, an ongoing project that uh, is. Uh, is starting to uh, be implemented. In fact, I think the Little Richard House, which in fact was on the right side in the shaded area, has been moved to the uh, to the left hand side of the of the screen. Uh, again, a very interesting project, one fraught with dilemma. Uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, I think there was there, for me there was clarity about uh, the importance and responsibility of doing. An example again, not unlike. Uh, the, the cabin at Oakland Plantation, these are two photos of their, their very simple houses, and um, many of them have uh, fallen into some level of disrepair, uh, but will be, uh, will be preserved and reoccupied and, and become an asset in the community they uh, come to get moved to. So the next, uh, looking at a few buildings, uh, go to the next slide. Well, this is 16th Street Baptist Church. I had the opportunity to work on the restoration of the exterior of the 16th Street Baptist Church. It's a wonderful uh, Wallace Rayfield, an important African American architect, uh, designed this uh, this church. Uh, and um, there are a lot of things I could say about it, but there's really one point I wanted to make, and um, and the point I wanted to make was as we were uh, dealing with the restoration of the exterior. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, the 16th Street Baptist Church was the site of the, the bombing that killed three young girls and uh, really um, uh, solidified the um, decisions to proceed with the um, civil rights and, and um, uh, legislation that eventually came about. What you see in the lower left is uh, the original building, and you, in the red circle, you'll see a stairway going up to the second floor. On the image to the right, you'll see that that stairway is gone. And <clears throat> the upper left corner, uh, upper left image, is a photo of where the bombing took place. And basically, the bomb was put under the stairwell on the side of the building. So we were um, dealing with the question of do you restore the side of the building to the way it was before the bomb, or do you take the condition that uh, changed a good bit the side, that area of the building when they repaired it, they removed the door, they changed the windows, uh, that um, arrangement on the side of the building is significantly different than what it was when the, when the second uh, upper level uh, stoop and entry was there. How do you deal with that? The answer to that was really was was quite simply resolved. The congregation said, "We cannot cope 
with the presence of that stare and the memory that that stare brings. And, um, and that made the solution quite simple um, and, uh, and quite emotional in terms of not only its absence, but what that absence means still in today's terms to a congregation that is still so, it is understandably um, moved and affected by the experience they went through. The, the upper right is the, the Wales window. Uh, it was a, a, a stained glass window given to the congregation in uh, respect for what they'd been through. Uh, and, um, and, and it's a very meaningful piece of international solidarity to the congregation and I think to the larger uh, civil rights movement. Uh, the next uh, uh, project is the Vulcan. Um, so the Vulcan is a very interesting project. Uh, the Vulcan statue was um, constructed in six months for the 1904 World's Fair to um, promote Birmingham as the steel uh, city of the, of the country. And it's the world's largest cast iron statue. Uh, they built it in six months, had it at the fair when they, uh, they conceived of the idea, built it and had it at the fair in six months. And after the fair, World's Fair in St. Louis, they had no idea what to do with it. So it came back and bummed around. And in 1930s, under the WPA, they built this, what was intended to be a lighthouse tower. You can see the Widow's Wall, the, oh, not Widow's Wall, but the, the uh, uh, upper uh, walk. Uh, and the uh, Vulcan is the beacon uh, overlooking downtown Birmingham. Um, so in the 70s, they clad it in what I call the George Jackson skin, uh, and it had, uh, back to the one on the left, it, had a, it has an interior set of stairs that goes up 10 floors to the, to the walk. There had become a tradition of people going up to the mountaintop and walking up the um, uh, walking up the uh, tower and getting a view of the city. In the 70s, they said, well, it was so popular, let's put an elevator up there, let's expand the top, let's clad it in a, in a marble, let's expand, let's tear down and expand the base. And um, uh, and so they did that, and that's what you see in the middle photo. Um, so the Vulcan was then designated a national landmark, uh, the city wanted to restore the, uh, the tower and the base and the walk, uh, and we then had to deal with the elevator. So the middle photo, when you are downtown looking up at the Vulcan, what you see are two towers. You see the elevator tower, and you see the Vulcan uh, tower, albeit modified. Uh, so we had this issue of do we never intended to have an elevator, but we from a preservation standpoint with it being a landmark, could we uh, not have an elevator? Could we just have people uh, have an interpretive uh, demonstration on, on the base where people who couldn't get up there could experience it through a video or whatever and return it to its more pristine condition? Uh, we had a meeting with the mayor um, one mem very memorable meeting in which the mayor said, when I was a boy, I could only go up into this tower one day a week. He said, we will have universal access to this tower. And at that point, the issue of whether we were going to have an elevator or not was no longer an issue. And it was really a question of how we did that. Uh, and this was our solution. Um, and um, it's got architectural relevance to the to the building in terms of the angles and the, the uh, scoring is the levels of the interior of the tower. There are ways we try to link the two together. But the, the the fundamental piece of this is that that tower is there as really a, a statement to African American history and um, and the fact that everyone would be allowed to go up in that in that tower. Uh, I just think it's an important piece of how uh, African American history is embedded in virtually uh, everything, and and um, and should be recognized. 
Uh, the next one is Pastel's Restaurant. Uh, as you know, in Atlanta, Pastel's was a um, the uh, African American owned restaurant and had a lounge. Uh, Pastel, the Pastel Brothers on the right there later built a, a motel. Uh, it was a, a place for uh, the African American community to hang out and to uh, come together. Um, and when uh, Martin Luther King was, was planning activities in Atlanta and all the civil rights leaders in the community could meet here, uh, those that were traveling had a place to stay. It was safe. You could come and stay, eat, recreate all in one spot without at risk of being out in the community and, and um, um, uh, um, someone harassing you. Uh, this is the state of it today. Uh, Clark Atlanta University is trying to come up with a way to actually uh, capture the importance of this building while, of all things, building a cancer research center around it. And um, as you can see from the photos, it'll be a, it's a challenging exercise. There's a great deal of fabric still there. Uh, but again, a, an exercise of uh, trying to acknowledge and capture, again, a, a modern modern style, um, important African-American site. The next one is the Auburn Avenue Commercial District. Uh, and um, yes. um, many of you, I'm sure, know about Auburn Avenue. It was one of the premier uh, African-American commercial districts in the U.S. It was cut in half by the interstate highway system, so that has had a dramatic effect on, uh, on the avenue. Uh, to the right in the, in the lower band across is the, is the uh, Google map of, of Auburn Avenue. You'll see the Martin Luther King Center and the National Historic Site facility, Wheat Street uh, Baptist Church, uh, uh, Beth, Big Bethel Baptist Church is along the street. Uh, its retail area, though, is struggling, and it's one of those areas that uh, very much needs a collaborative, respectful, collaborative infusion to understand how to preserve, interpret uh, what was a, um, a almost solely African-American commercial district uh, in a more pluralistic environment. And how do you do that? How do you tell those stories? How do you communicate the significance of that uh, in, in, a, uh, in a more integrated time? I think it's a very um, significant challenge we face in discussing it and coming up with a way to um, to hopefully retain the experience of uh, what it meant to be on Auburn Avenue um, uh, in, in, in its heyday. This is the uh, MLA Life Insurance Building on the left. Uh, and what you see on the right is what it is today. And, and I, I'm really sad to say that within this building on the right uh, is housed a number of homeless people who come in through a back window that's broken. And um, it's one of the more important uh, architectural icons of Auburn Avenue uh, and of African American history uh, in Atlanta and, uh, and desperately needs uh, attention. To, uh, to preserve it. The next one is the Birmingham Civil Rights Monument, uh, something I'm uh, working on at the moment. Um, what you see is the, in the red uh, dash line is the uh, monument boundary. Uh, and what you see in the red squares are uh, contributing buildings to that uh, monument area. Uh, I've taken a little bit of license for that. I've included the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute because I think uh, it, it, it is or will be uh, deemed meaningful. Uh, Kelly Ingram Park uh, is, uh, <laughs> yeah. So here you can see uh, St. Paul's United Methodist Church. You can see 16th Street Baptist Church there. Um, St. Paul's, it was every better part of the uh, the Civil Rights Movement, 16th Street got uh, obviously much more attention because of the bombing, uh, but St. Paul's was uh, was extremely active during that time as well. 
Um, you can see the AG Gaston Motel. It is uh, the, the equivalent of Pascal's in, uh, in Birmingham. The, uh, A.G. Gaston was the first African-American millionaire in Alabama. Uh, he developed a motel uh, as a, a modernist a motel, a modern style motel uh, drive-in that, um, like Pascal's, had a restaurant. He had a cafe. Uh, and so it, too, was uh, somewhat self-contained. Um, across the street, you see the Gaston office building, which housed his businesses. Uh, the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge is an extremely important uh, building, and Kelly Ingram Park, where a lot of the uh, conflict happened in the civil rights campaign here. Uh, the other interesting thing about this site is it's a little uh, architectural mecca of African American architects. You have the Wallace Rayfield building on 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, Stanley Eccles was an African American architect that did the motel. Uh, Robert Taylor was the a premier architect who uh, to the Tuskegee Architecture School is named for. Uh, not African American, but uh, A.G. Gaston went to the premier bank building company in the country, he sent a uh, bank building corporation to do a first class, and I think one of the first modern buildings in, in Birmingham uh, was the A.G. Gaston office building. So um, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to um, to understand this site, uh, and I think this is a particularly unique Max Bond, uh, who was the who's an African American architect, the biggest early Bond in New York, designed the uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. So it's uh, it's got rich with uh, African American architectural history as well. Uh, these are the these are the uh, three prominent architects that are all uh, represented. Um, in that district. So one of the so here is another um, view of the district. You'll see in this case the boundary is in a beige checkered line, um, and the yellow areas are undeveloped properties, parking lots, vacant lots. And the question is, how do you deal with this monument, meaning the boundary, the dash line boundary? Uh, in a way that can embrace the future. You've got all of this undeveloped property. So you say, we're not going to let anything happen. We're going to keep it just like it is. And what it becomes is a, uh, a very low intensity, uh, area that's, that's somewhat spread out and, uh, difficult to sustain, uh, a daily urban vitality. If you include those sites, how do you do that in a way that again, like the Bourbon Avenue, uh, that um, retains the vitality of its African American history in possibly a more pluralistic way or, or some other way. I think it's an extremely important challenge that is a, a model for, uh, for many places in the country. The red uh, area buildings in the upper right of the, uh, are the AT&T building, and the Alabama Power Building. And unfortunately, this is a case where uh, new development encroached on the, on the area and has created, in effect, a blank wall. And um, so working with those businesses, those in corporate entities, and how those elevations can become more animated and more respectful of the district, I think, is a, an important uh, challenge and opportunity for all concerned uh, when in capturing the full potential of the, of the civil rights monument. So I want to say a word about the AG Gaston Motel. Um, this is a uh, shot of it in the, in the yellow and the red. So the, the red is, uh, was built in 1953 and the yellow was built in 1968. Well, all of the civil rights activity happened in the red area, and uh, that area, that property is fixing to be uh, restored. The property on the right will be rehabilitated. Here's an example of, of uh, uh, Dr. King and uh, uh, Reverend Abernathy. You can see Andy Young, Andrew Young, and the overalls in the back. 
uh, holding a press conference in the courtyard. Uh, some of these images, because there's been so much change to this property, will be guiding us in, in doing the uh, restoration work of, of the property. Um, okay. uh, this is an uh, illustration of how the property uh, evolved. Um, it is in two main campaigns of change. Uh, this is the uh, building as it looked in its original form. Uh, Gaston did very quickly add a restaurant on the side, so we'll actually be restoring up to and including the restaurant addition, but give you an idea of a um, terrific modernist uh, character. The area on the right is the cafe. Uh, on the left, next to the port de chair, is the uh, lobby. Uh, of the two-story area behind the sign uh, is was called the, the War Room. That was where Dr. King stayed, and they had a, it was a, the only suite. And they did the planning for the Project C campaign C in uh, Birmingham. Uh, you, the buildings of uh, some of these features have no longer exist. The structure, the brick structure on the right, doesn't exist. So how we deal with that? environment that was important to interpreting this site as something that uh, we'll be struggling we work in that. There was also a bombing. So, um, unlike, I mean, not, uh, unlike uh, 16th Street, there were, no one was injured here, but there was a bombing, and how do we deal with that uh, location uh, and the treatment? It's been filled in with brick now, but how do we deal with that? Uh, the red are basically things that were added that are no longer contributing important to the character. The green are features that are important to the character that we will retain. Uh, same here, you can look at the green and the red and see uh, things that we'll need to restore or reconstruct and those that will be retained. Photos, for historic photos, we found that it had modern uh, Herman Miller furniture. This, these are photos of the of the uh, war room and the suite. Uh, so we have very good documentation of uh, of what those spaces look like and the kind of furnishings that were there. Uh, the the final one is the AG Guest building. I'll just say a word about that. Uh, this was the uh, first modern building in Atlanta. I mean, in Birmingham. Sorry, uh, it had the first uh, Walgreens drugstore. And uh, you'll see the very interesting mosaic on the left. It was a 600-room auditorium where uh, Gaston would bring his insurance uh, reps in and have community events. They had a weekly gospel scene here, and so there was a history of music here as well. Uh, these are just uh, how the, the spaces were arranged. I won't go into that now. An uh, example of the dedication, the 1,000 people in the and in a uh, 600 seat space for the dedication. The character of the office, it was as fine an uh, executive suite as you find anywhere. It was a really represented the uh, achievement uh, that was special for Gaston and for, for Birmingham and for Alabama. Uh, his wife had a, a vocational school, uh, and the second floor of the building was her business school. Uh, we found photos of that too that will be very helpful. Uh, finally, I just wanted to comment. Uh, many of you may know that uh, there is an initiative to designate a group of civil rights structures for the World Heritage Listing. Uh, that's being directed under Georgia State University uh, at the, with the support of the Alabama legislature. Uh, and they are currently uh, working through a series of uh, investigations about how to construct such a multiple listing uh, and um, and what properties are candidates for being in it. So very ambitious, uh, and I think has implications much broader than just the uh, outcome of the World Heritage designation, uh, but uh, but rich with what it can produce over time. So that's um, that's what I um, have to offer, and I would love to um, answer any questions.
All right, this is the point. If you had any questions, uh, we've gotten some really good ones that I'm going to now ask Mr. Carver, but feel free to type in any. So one question that comes in, can you do amendments to add African American historic resources to an existing property on the National Register to recognize African American or civil rights significance to the structure? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would suggest you uh, contact your local uh, preservation organization or the state preservation office, uh, and I'm sure they will be more than happy to help you um, through that process. Uh, do you know of any good funding sources to help survey African American communities? Well, funding, as I, I pointed out a couple of times, is a challenge. Is a challenge, and um, um, I, I, I don't, there is no uh, central place. Um, I think to me the thing to do is to um, consider uh, who you can, who can be captured, whose interest can be captured about the value and importance. Some of that may be uh, uh, family genealogically related. Uh, some of it may be uh, community-based. Some of it may be uh, larger you know, scale, meaning uh, national scale folks. There are foundations that if you uh, create a compelling enough story, we'll consider uh, funding these sorts of things. And it's a matter of doing research to identify those that um, um, that are candidates. I, it is a highly competitive world in that sphere because obviously everybody's asking the same question, uh, but it's not one to be deterred from. Uh, it just takes, it's not gonna come easy. It just takes some digging and some creative thinking and um, alliances to, uh, to put something like that together. But uh, oftentimes state preservation offices have, in Georgia, for instance, uh, they have a, a fund that they fund surveys. And so, uh, you know, you might start with the state preservation office and see if they have resources. They're oftentimes small, relatively small grants uh, that can, uh, with, with student uh, labor and with some um, good technical professional skills supporting them, uh, can achieve some good outcomes. So, uh, can you give us any examples or have you seen successful ways to increase economic development in a traditional African American area? Well, um, I, I think it goes back to um, um, defining the, an outcome. And, and knowing what the boundaries are, what the context is for development. And uh, the Birmingham Civil Rights Monument, I think, is a, an excellent example. You have all of these development parcels. Uh, really, across from the Gaston Motel, uh, there is a very small drugstore. But other than that, there's nothing. It's vacant lots. And, um, and so infusing vitality is, is critical. The main reality is the main way that's going to happen is through investment. So having and creating an environment where investment can be structured around capturing and respecting and using and interpreting the, the African-American history, um, I think is, is critical to achieving the broader objectives. But I think, uh, it, at least for now, um, in some part, it's got to include creating an environment for private investment. In the neighborhood of Macon, we talked about were any oral histories done about the the feel and the movement and the neighborhood itself before it was moved. There were not. Uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of uh, opportunity for that. I, I would say there was a robust community participation. Uh, I would say that participation was 
substantially led by folks who had the long view history of that of that uh, situation, that road coming through, etc. Um, um, I think the neighborhood itself has declined, though the city of Birmingham, uh, the city of Lakeland, rather, um, has, um, I think, reaffirmed its desire and commitment to, to reinvigorate that neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, it goes back to the uh, the question I raised before, uh, is it going to be an uh, all-African-American neighborhood, or do you want it to be an integrated neighborhood? The question is, what are your objectives, and how do you retain that uh, importance of African-American history, and what are the implications for how you approach that? So, um, uh, the, the memorandum of agreement was pretty straightforward. And so much of the um, discussion and communication with the neighborhood had to do with the pattern in which these houses would be located, uh, what other kinds of one of the structures, a uh, Masonic Lodge that was going to be used for community purposes. Uh, Little Richard's house is going to become a little museum. Uh, so there were discussions around the range of things that that might happen there as well, beyond just moving the houses. But um, there's still a, there's still a task to see that neighborhood uh, restabilize and um, um, be be sound for the for the long term. Any insight as to why African American historic preservation efforts? seem more difficult in the North and Midwest than preservation efforts in the Southern states? Well, I can't speak to that. I did spend a decade in St. Louis, but I'm not sure St. Louis is a, a good example from a Midwestern standpoint. It may be, it went away a while, but um, I really don't know. I mean, obviously African American history uh, is, is deeply rooted in the South, and, and there's a large constituency um, in the South. I, there was an article in the, in the uh, New York Times a week or two ago, recently, uh, talked about um, African American professionals moving back to the South. And um, so I think that it's uh, you know, probably got more critical mass, if you will. And um, um, like I said early on, the, the substance of the civil rights movement is still playing itself out. And, uh, and some of that may be regional, but it's not getting the attention it needs. Now, I don't know the answer. I'm speculating on that. But uh, it's not a reason not to uh, continue to uh, raise awareness of, of the importance of the resource. And to do that in a, in a broader way, I mean, the, uh, the uh, World Monuments Fund uh, exercises, including properties in Kansas, for example. So um, um, there are ways to, to, to engage in a broader context, too. So in recent years, people have raised concerns about existing Secretary of Interior standards or guidelines making it difficult to preserve these sites. You mentioned the challenges of moving buildings. It sounds like there was a good uh, resolve, that it was resolved and the project was successful. Were there other challenges posted by the Secretary of Interior standards that could not be overcome through discussions with the NPS or the SHIPO? Well, let me say, I don't... Uh, I have some personal challenges with the Secretary of Interior standards, particularly relative to treatment uh, and how they describe treatment. Because reconstruction, which is a treatment, is not preservation, it's new construction. Rehabilitation is a vague term. Uh, I understand it, and it's intended to provide some bit more flexibility within a historic context for what you can do. Uh, but really, restoration and preservation, which actually tie specifically the time, are the key ones. Um, the, the Secretary of Interior standards are not intended to sub 
prescribe. They're only to um, guide and be a resource for creating this deep understanding of the property and what in physical terms uh, embody that history. Um, so I don't see the, the Secretary of Interior standards being as much an issue as one of how one deals with change in a historic context. To me, you've got to decide what things need to stay. And then you need to be creative to figure out ways to incorporate new uses within that context. It doesn't mean you can't have Wi-Fi, you can have new data, you can have new wiring, you can kind of have new systems, but it's important to have the fabric preserved uh, for, as I showed in the graphic, future generations and uh, the concept of reversibility. Uh, so I don't think the Secretary of Interior standards are the culprit. I will say that there are some, uh, because they're, uh, I'm cautious in using the word vague, but because they're pretty general, um, they, all, they, they can be interpreted more literally than they maybe should be, uh, to be, to be suggesting that they're, they're literal or black, or black and white, uh, ways of dealing with things. Um, but generally that, I think, shippos and, and folks that are doing with these, uh, are pretty sophisticated now. Uh, I will say that most people reviewing or don't have an architectural background. And I think that's a, it's a problem for the architecture profession. Uh, but it also makes it a little harder for people who aren't um, educated so much in the design professions, probably more in architectural styles than in design, to uh, be comfortable uh, making decisions about how you uh, modify buildings. Now, it, it if everyone knows, I swap back to the or the slide with our, our three architects that uh, Jack mentioned. I had several questions about their names again. So that and one question that also comes up is, do you know of any other good resources that talks about uh, more about the African American architects? Yes, there's a whole book. There's a, an encyclopedia of African American architects. I think if you go online, you can find it. It's uh, I'm not sure it's still. Publication, but you may be able to find it through ABE books, or an online news book site, or, or places like that. But that's uh, that's the Bible of, uh, so far uh, of African American architects. You have any title? Uh, I don't remember. I should, but I don't. All right, and we're almost out of time here. Yes, I think you can find it if you, if you Google it. I think you know, just Google the subject. I think you'll. You'll find it. And any questions we didn't get to, we will include them on the transcript of, uh, of the recorded webinar. And I just want to thank everyone that tuned in. Uh, we did record the webinar, so we will be posting that. It'll take us a little while. Uh, we have to send uh, any recordings that we do, we have to get them transcribed for 88 clients. So we'll have that transcribed in the video as soon as we can. Uh, on the CPT website, and we'll send out a Facebook post, that sort of thing, when we do. Uh, so thank you again. And like I said, if we didn't get your question, uh, we'll stick it on the transcript in the end. And thank you again, and we hope that you'll tune in to future webinars. So we wanted to uh, especially uh, thank Jack Cogburn for coming in and giving our talk today. Thank you.